Okay, um, today and for one hour on Tuesday next week, we shall discuss the Vikings and in particular their impact upon Britain and Ireland during the period of their activity, which, just so we know roughly what we're dealing with, from a little bit before 800 we get early references to Vikings and although they continue in one form or another later on we might talk about them until the sort of middle of the 11th century then uh, the situation in their homeland changes and we might not talk about these people as Vikings as opposed to Scandinavians. Here is one of the most famous Vikings of the cartoon world, of course, Hagar or Hagar the Horrible. Um, he's quite a useful point to start for various reasons. Uh, but uh, what's the main mistake? What's wrong historically with this picture? And not to say, you know, the color of his hair or something like that, but there is one recurring element in the way that we view or depict Vikings, and here's, this, I found another one slightly less cartoon-like, I know, mrcostumes.com there, so you can buy your own Viking costume or something. So what does this guy and Hagar, what have they got in common, which is in fact historically inaccurate? Does anyone know? Some people know, because we were discussing it before, but we can't... Uh, Özge, do you know what's wrong with this picture of Hagar, Hagar the Horrible? What's the historically incorrect feature there? I think the head... Okay, good start. You're getting hot. Uh, You're warm. We don't have evidence that they, uh, they have worn uh, these heads like this. Yeah, it's the horns, that's right. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure when it started, perhaps we might think like 19th century or something like that with paintings or whatever, but this classic image of the Viking warrior, whether as we say cartoon-like here or this commercial one here with this guy who's got a very fine set of horns on his head. Um, as far as we know from archaeological evidence, uh, obviously some Vikings will have worn helmets to protect their heads. Uh, not all of them, I don't suppose, but uh, it was not uh, common for them to have these horned heads. So let's dispel that uh, myth uh, at the start. So let's, before we look at the British Isles in a bit of detail, let's have a look at sort of the background to the Vikings, and uh, Genghis has already been doing that today a bit with my colleague Paul, I believe. Um, here is a nice map taken from Gwyn Jones's book, The Vikings, if I remember, which kind of shows the world according to the Vikings. Now, obviously, their homeland, homelands, well, this area, which is what we call Scandinavia. But through a number of activities, of which the most famous is, of course, the violence represented by Hagar's sword there, but other forms of activity as well, uh, they had uh, quite a significant impact upon not only Western Europe, but in fact, North America. They were the first Europeans to reach North America, but not in a lasting way, in the way that Columbus's discovery uh, was to later on, but also they had influence primarily through trade further east, through what becomes the Slavic lands of Russia and Ukraine, down to the Black Sea and even uh, into the Caspian Sea, and for a while uh, there was a so-called Varangian Guard in Byzantium, uh, which had some kind of Scandinavian origin as well. I think we have some runic inscriptions there and so forth. And we have accounts of Vikings coming the other way around into the Mediterranean as well. Obviously we're going to focus on Britain and Ireland and we'll say a little bit about their homeland and also about this little splat here 
which hasn't come well on the um, copy, which is the Faroe Islands. And the slightly larger island up here is Iceland, Island. I won't say much today about Greenland, Grönland, uh, they called it green to encourage people to go there, I suppose, or um, these areas here in what's now Canada, uh, this is the famous archaeological discovery at Lance O Meadows, uh, which they called Vinland, which may or may not mean Wineland. Uh, there's some debate about that, I think. So we're focusing on here, but trying to put it briefly into the bigger context of uh, Viking activity in general. So, in addition to being violent raiders, I'll put the word up there because many, many years ago in the history of civilization, I spent five or ten minutes discussing Vikings as raiders rather than traders, and at the end of it, someone put their hand up and said, Hodjam, what does raiding mean? So I have to start again. Uh, so. Raiding means obviously attacking, plundering, and stealing uh, things from uh, a person or usually a group of people, a settlement or whatever. And that's the common image we have of a Viking band arriving in their longship. And I think we have a famous example uh, of the Osseberg longship found in Norway. Okay, it doesn't have, this one has a nice curling shape. It doesn't have one of those kind of dragon heads or whatever, but still characteristic and very famous one in the burial, I think. Arriving in these ships, attacking a village or a church or something, and then running away. That's the classic idea of uh, uh, the trade, uh, raid image. Trade, we shall discuss a little bit more, very important. In addition, but not for the sake of it, I don't suppose, they were involved in significant exploration. Okay, this is how they found Greenland and uh, North America. And in addition, as a result, they often were involved, later on at least, in significant settlement of certain areas, which may, depending on how things go, lead to notable political change in some places. So, for example, for a long time, a large part of the north of England was ruled, was settled, but ruled by people of Scandinavian origin. Uh, okay, and only later on did the English kings reconquer that. And over here, okay, we have the foundation of what is called Normandy, which was a separate, ultimately, uh, uh, dukedom in duchy in northern France, but settled originally by Vikings. Okay, to some extent independent from the King of France, but it becomes part of the Kingdom of France in the way it's organized later. We'll return to Normandy in a few weeks' time. And obviously places that were less settled already, the Faroe Islands, Iceland and Greenland, as we said, uh, form separate Viking or Scandinavian countries. Okay, so Scandinavia proper, what are the three, well, the, today we would include Finland, but we'll ignore Finland for the moment. What are the three continental or mainland um, Scandinavian countries? Denmark. So this isn't such a great map because it's on the fold of the page. Let's see if I've got a similar map but a bit clearer for what we're doing. Yes, this is a better. Let's put this one up from Peter Sawyer's book methinks. Okay, let's ignore that. So, okay, for some reason at some point in the past, yes. So we have Finland here, we'll ignore that. Sweden here, Norway here, and then Denmark here. Okay. And for our purposes, for the purposes of what's happening in Britain and Ireland, we're going to be interested in Norwegians and Danes primarily. We'll have less evidence of Swedes being active across the North Sea into the British Isles. Their activity to some extent was involved pushing eastwards uh, a little bit more. So the people we're talking about were going to be Norwegians and to some extent Danes. Let's say a bit about their language. Do we know what group or family of languages or subfamily the Vikings language or languages belong to? Anyone know? Fati? 
Germanic, okay, and I hope if I've got my order correct, here we have an indication of that. Let's get much bigger. Okay, we're talking Germanic, and there's a slight, there's a few errors in that, I think. Uh, North Germanic, as current linguistic understanding has it, okay, which uh, is what we would call here the oldest form is Old Norse. And that's divided, there's a number of ways of looking at uh, their languages. Sometimes uh, they divide it up into, well actually it should be West North Germanic and East North Germanic. So that, those, those are in the wrong order, okay. And the Western branch includes modern Norwegian proper as opposed to Norwegian influenced by Danish. Um, and also Icelandic and we should add here Faroese which is the form of, lang of the Norse language still spoken in the Faroe Islands and in addition Norn which was the language spoken by Scandinavian settlers in the Shetlands and Orkneys and that died out during the 18th or perhaps 19th centuries. Um, but Icelandic is by far the uh, most uh, populous one of those. So Icelandic and Norwegian are kind of related and then on the other side we have Danish and Swedish okay and this kind of I'm not really sure how it all works out but the Riksmal form of Norwegian which is spoken in Norway it used to be spoken earlier in Norway or something which is um, influenced by Danish to some extent but primarily we say Norwegian, Icelandic, Danish and Swedish they divide up in these western eastern uh, ways. Alternatively sometimes people suggest because Norwegian, Danish and Swedish as they're spoken today uh, are quite similar as languages and they are more synthetic, similar in structure to say English, whereas Icelandic and Faroese are still inflected languages and so they're much more close to what Old Norse was like, the language of, uh, not necessarily of the Vikings, but the language of the 12th and 13th centuries uh, in uh, Scandinavia. Sometimes they divide them up into insular Scandinavian or insular North Germanic versus continental or mainland. Okay. Uh, and that's to do with kind of structure as opposed to as phonological uh, and genetic relationships and so on. Another point to make about the Vikings as well as being Scandinavian and speaking the language is for a large part of the period most of the people that we will call Vikings were pagan and editor you're going to give us a presentation next week we agreed on their mythology so I'll say very little about that now partly because I don't know a lot about the details and I wasn't planning to anyway but she's going to cover that in her presentation next week obviously the Scandinavians, Vikings, whatever you want to call them who were active and eventually settle in Western Europe, in the Christian parts of Western Europe, so in the British Isles for our purposes, but also in uh, France and elsewhere. Uh, in some cases, quite quickly, they will have perhaps intermarried with local people, local women or whatever, and then some of them will have become Christian, and we have evidence of that in some cases from fairly early on. So uh, it wasn't an absolute pagan thing, it wasn't an identity uh, thing with them, but uh, for the earlier period in particular, okay, we have to stress their paganism, that they have a cultural separation from the other peoples of Western Europe whom they are attacking or interacting with one way or another. And it adds to the sort of nasty or bad press image which uh, poor old Hagar has, okay, I mean he looks like a, an angry pagan there or something, doesn't he? He's going to do something nasty as opposed to someone who believes nice things in the Bible or whatever. Uh, and obviously please, any pagans watching this, don't send me emails, this is just a, a generalization. Okay, so, why did this people of Scandinavia, who had had relatively little impact on world history, uh, uh, before that, but why in the decades leading up to 800 did they suddenly and off 
often rather violently burst upon the historical scene out of their uh, northern European homeland and become uh, famous or infamous and so on. Any ideas why? And you're welcome to throw lots of ideas out because lots of ideas have been suggested and I don't think even yet scholars agree on one or even a number of reasons. Right, okay. Population increase vis-a-vis -vis land, I suppose, um, or resources, to use it more. And this is quite, a, quite an old idea, quite a well-established idea, that um, there was a growing, there was a demographic increase in Scandinavia, uh, but less uh, cultivatable land or whatever, and this forced them to look beyond their borders to find land, but also other ways of perhaps gaining wealth or whatever, which involves uh, violence as well as settlement and so forth. Um, it may be one important factor, um, but not necessarily the only one as well. Uh, Uzge, you were going to say? Yeah. Uh, change, change the nature, for example, uh, um, quite a big uh, climate change in their uh, homelands. Okay, yeah, well, yeah, okay, we, the, the movements of these things, yeah, no, that's a possibility, I don't know the details of kind of climate change and so on in general, but yeah, I mean, uh, that would work on the other side of the coin, so not the human side uh, of the equation, but of the side of the resources and things like that, whatever might, if we're entering into a cold period on things and perhaps uh, less land or is fertile or cultivatable, you might uh, press on the, on the um, population as well, and you mentioned politics, which has also been suggested. And in some sources, for example, uh, it's given very explicitly in the later sagas written by Icelanders, which we're talking about, well, 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, they said, they in particular say that these people were leaving Norway and they end up in Iceland or elsewhere because of the activities of a guy called Harald Harfagr, uh, Harald Finehair or Fairhair, who was supposedly by the, I think in the 9th century, is consolidating, uh, or 10th century, sorry, is consolidating his political power in Norway and obviously undermining uh, the power of certain elites and so on. But his period of activity is quite late, okay? We can't use him to explain Viking raids at the end of the 8th century, for example. Norway, a little bit earlier, we see some kind of political centralization, political activity, and they're interacting with the, um, with the growing power of, of Charlemagne and his successors as they're spreading the Frankish Empire, so that might have an effect on them as well. And so we get a picture of things going on here a little bit. Political change a bit later in Norway, we suspect, and things like that. We have evidence of the archaeological evidence of their long ships, of their famous boats and so on, which allowed them obviously to take long journeys across, not just across rivers and around the coastline, but also across vast areas of open sea, which other people in Western Europe didn't have that technology at that point. Effectively, uh, they had a, an initial sort of monopoly on that, the way that they put their ships together and so on, clinker-built bases and things like that. Um, so that's sometimes thrown into the mix. Uh, then we have to ask then, is this a means or an end? Okay, just because you've got boats, do you have to go and become nasty guys and kill people? You, well, they did other things as well, as we say, and so on, but uh, was it something which led them to use the boats or even press them to ba make better boats and leave Scandinavia rather than the boats themselves explaining that? But again, perhaps it's just a big mixture of things. And what's often been said, this is uh, uh, not my phrase, I don't, I'm, but um, is that different Vikings were doing different things for different reasons at different times, okay? So there's no one single reason to explain uh, the sort of development or characteristic features of the Viking Age. It was a, a very mixed uh, period that had different explanations at different times and so on. 
I want to say a little bit about our sources first, and then I want us to do something together um, uh, by way of kind of reading and analysis, perhaps even for the rest of this class. We've got about half an hour left. Um, one of the problems with studying the Vikings uh, as historians, so that means focusing on written sources at the moment, is that we have very little which we can call contemporary sources written by the Vikings themselves. Okay. Contemporary sources, things which actually were written down during the 9th or 10th centuries, uh, with the exception of a relatively small number of runic inscriptions. They had uh, the Germanic system of runic inscription, of runic alphabet, which they used in various ways and so on. With the exception of the run runic inscriptions from many places, but that's not a large and kind of focused uh, set of corpus of sources. With the exception of that, um, contemporary references to Vikings come from not from themselves, but from their victims or the other people with whom they interacted. Okay. So let's just put here Western Europeans or whatever, okay, to be very general about that. The Scandinavian sources themselves, we begin in the 11th century to some extent. We have a few Latin uh, accounts and chronicles and things like that. And it's in the 12th to 13th century we see a growth of uh, things written by Scandinavians, including, as I've mentioned already, the famous Icelandic sagas, some of which are highly fictional and have ghosts and other things in them. Others seem fairly kind of historical, at least on the surface, and they deal sometimes with historical figures, English kings interacting with Vikings and things like that. And it's very tempting in these often quite long narratives to say, well, there's some historical accuracy in here and try and read them as historical sources. They are three or four centuries after the events they're describing. Uh, they've been passed down, perhaps in some cases, by uh, oral tradition, but they've also been changed and written down for particular purposes at the time. And it's very, it includes references to Harold Fairhair that I mentioned before. And although some historians have used Viking sagas quite a lot in trying to write about the Vikings, in general people say, no, we've got to be very careful about these. It's not to say they're 100% unreliable. It is, for example, from... Um, what we would call Icelandic sagas that we know about, that we have an account or accounts, slightly differing accounts, of Vikings arriving in Vinland in North America. Okay? So there's some accuracy there. The details may not be true, but the general picture is accurate and so on. So to write about the Vikings, we can say a little bit about them and their society and generalize from things like this. We've got a problem of looking back from their, uh, their own historical but also not so historical sources from the Central and later Middle Ages, and there's a big methodological problem here, or we stay with the contemporary sources written down by Western Europeans. Now, the uh, reading material I wanted to give you for this week, but for some strange reason I said I, I forgot to bring the bibliography and stuff last time, but here's the bibliography. And Sorry. And here's the reading material will come round next. What I'm going to do now is we shall, and this isn't just me being lazy, um, but we shall, oops, sorry, we shall uh, read through, or you shall read through this yourselves for a few minutes. Uh, so in fact, Emra, from now until I say, let's go, we can kind of cut this for the final version. You can keep filming, but because it's just going to be people sitting there like that for a few minutes. OK. So please read through this. Now, I'll tell you a bit about what we've got. We've got 10 years from a very important Irish source called the Annals of Ulster, okay, a later compilation of analytic 
sources based upon a number of um, documents and so on. Uh, we're looking at the period from uh, 840 to 850. Okay, the, so we're into the 9th century. On the one side, because you've got parallel text, you've got the original text, which is in this mixture of, of Irish and Latin. Obviously, ignore the left-hand side, and just from 840 down to 850, kind of read very quickly, okay, ignoring the strange names and not worrying about things too much, just getting a kind of impression of what's going on here. Now, I know that you're none of you are Irish historians, so you won't necessarily know the distinction between, uh, I don't know, Faith Limith and Torah or someone like that, but uh, whether it's an Irishman or a Viking or whatever, but have a read through and then we'll have a little discussion of this together uh, afterwards and it might give us some idea of, of the problem of using sources and so on. Okay, how are we doing? I estimate we've got about 15 minutes left, so let's um, have a short discussion of this text. We don't need to go into the details. I don't need to ask you about individual entries in too much detail, but there are a number of impressions, a number of thoughts which come out, and relating particularly to the point I was saying before, that to write the history of the Vikings, particularly during the 9th and 10th centuries, during the Scandinavians during that period, we are primarily uh, using documents like this. A couple of questions to ask at the start, and then we'll perhaps look into the, some of the points there and some of the patterns and so on. But firstly, who do you think, who in the plural here, um, was or were the writers of these entries here? Monks, okay, clerics of one sort or another, clergymen. They were the literate uh, elite of the early Middle Ages and uh, living in churches, they were sitting down keeping local records and the Annals of Ulster is a compilation of a number of these built up over uh, a number of centuries and various stages of, of compilation and so on. So for example, you can even see uh, for uh, 840, 839 equals 840. Number eight, you can see it's given in slightly smaller font. Okay, it says in this in this year below, the Norsemen first came to Ireland, according to the Schenchus, according to the history or whatever. Now, we know that the Vikings have been there almost 50 years earlier. They had done things in Ireland. This is a kind of another stage of compilation where someone's sitting down with two different things and saying, OK, in this one, they come to Ireland for the first time here. OK, I'll add it at the end or whatever as a note. And that's how these things get built up. So sometimes you even have the same event described in two different years because of the problems of chronology and so on. So they're built up from a series of perhaps more local chronicles or annals but written primarily, as we're saying, by monks, people living in those Irish churches that we were talking about uh, in, uh, on Tuesday. For the 11 years between 840 and 850, during inclusive, therefore, I calculated we have 107 events described. And the numbering, obviously, is the modern editors. The, the original compilation doesn't have these nice numbers down the side, but things are, the numbers have been added by uh, the editors of this uh, chronicle, and um, because they see something different is being described. Okay. And I see a total of 107 uh, events being described. Sometimes more than one event perhaps occurs within the same entry, so I should say entry here. What kinds of things are described in these entries and what kinds of events? We're not thinking just about Vikings here, just in general, what are the kinds of things that are being described and who, whom is being referred to in these things? Who are the people? Yeah, it's, it's members of the elite, the members of the ruling families, kings and their close relatives, and the high churchmen, abbots and things like that, or whatever, okay. And as you say, we don't, 
in these chronicles get references, perhaps very occasionally if they do something very bad, but we don't really get members of the lower orders of Irish society mentioned here. So it's the big guys, okay? And as you said, it's, it's largely about death, either by natural means or at someone else's hand, okay? I haven't calculated that, but if we did, we would probably see a large percentage of death being recorded by one way or another. What's with your impression, and you may or may not get all the references, but where do the Vikings fit in? Are they significant? There are some newcomers in, this, uh, in society uh, where these all these uh, documents are uh, written. And here, for example, it says in the museum that the Norsemen first came to Ireland. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, they uh, not only um, they killed uh, the these noble people and the religious people, they also uh, plundered and uh, sometimes uh, some, uh, have done some violent uh, things in the society, I guess. Uh, yes. Coming in to yeah, okay. Other things as well. Okay, I made, I, made, I made a quick survey. Here's, what, here's the way they're described. I'm, I'm referring here to the original texts and so on. We have Nordmanni, which is translated probably more as, mainly as North or Norse men, okay, which occasionally is equivalent in Irish to the Lochlan, which is a very loose term but sometimes taken to be Norway or something like that. Again, in Latin we have Gentili, which comes out in the Irish as Genti or something. Uh, Gentiles, okay, which is what? When we use the word Gentiles, what implications does that have? Does anyone know? Sorry? Well, yes, but according to whom? I mean, where does the concept of Gentiles originally come from? Anyone know their Bible or whatever? That's the question I'm asking here. The concept is that the Gentiles are people who are not Jewish, okay, in the Old Testament, or whatever, the way we refer now. So there is the Jewish people, and then there are Gentiles, which is all the others. But then it comes to mean kind of barbarians, others, which is what it means here, okay. So pagans is perhaps another translation of this. And also, in the Irish, they also sometimes use the word gal, which means something like foreigner, or whatever, something like that as well. And I think they're all, you'll find different combinations and so on in here. So pagans and heathens, north men, so two things, they come from the north, all their pagans or whatever, all their just kind of loosely foreigners and things like that, okay, it's the other phrases. So that tells us a bit about the perspective on, on their style and things. Uh, the Vikings, according to my calculation, occur in 29 out of the 107 entries. Either they get named, very occasionally you get someone mentioned, but for this period it's mainly just references to them. And that's quite a high percentage, I think, fairly high, given that you know, it's meant to be what Irish people are doing, but uh, almost a quarter of what the Irish people are concerned with, or the clergymen who write this down are concerned with, was Viking activity. Okay, so from getting up until going to bed at night, they're kind of worried about the Vikings 25% or more or something like that. And obviously that's not a correct way of putting it, but you get the point. It seems quite high. And I'm sure there are other periods where we'd even get a higher percentage of Viking activity and so on. So, to use the Turkish phrase, they're giving importance to the Vikings in these chronicles during this period. It's a big thing, a big impact on their lives. And as you were saying, it's a, a fairly violent kind of impact as well, primarily. Killing, stealing, burning, capturing and taking away people and things like that. Okay, that's the main thing. Now, I haven't quantified all those, but you could, you could approach that in another way. Similarly, we get at least a couple of references. Okay, for the year 842, so on the second opening, entry number 10, it says, Kovan, abbot of Linduchel, was fatally wounded and burnt by heathens and Irish. 
Okay? So they seem to be acting together or independently, but the Irish and the heathens are up to something there. Okay? Uh, they obviously thought it worth mentioning. And something later on, let's see if I can find that one quickly. Um, yes, uh, 847. So a few pages ahead of where you are. 847, number 3. Mael Shechnel destroyed the island of Loch Munrava, overcoming there a large band of wicked men of the Lugni and Galenga, who had been plundering the territories in the manner of the heathens. Okay, More gentilium in the Latin uh, original. Um, so it's even got to a point at some point, someone thought you know, attacking and raiding and killing people or churches was kind of the Moors, the style of the Vikings, Viking style or something like that, uh, or whatever. Uh, so at that point, by even before 850, they're describing these things in that way, which is, may or may not be interesting, but uh, tells us a little bit about how they perceived these things. So, we've got monks writing about Viking activity in a fairly large way, okay, recording a lot of Viking activity, mainly violent Viking activity, not only, but largely against churches, okay, and churchmen, destroying churches and so on. And here, for example, is a map of early medieval Ireland, and all the crosses are monasteries known to have been attacked by Vikings. Okay. They obviously went for monasteries uh, as one of their main sources of plunder and violence. Why? Because they're pagan or, yeah, okay, partly they're not defended. These, these are the innocents that we talked about last time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, the churches were uh, relatively wealthy, okay, some more than others. They would have had ornaments and things on the altars. They would have had gold, perhaps covers on some of the copies of the Bible and other things. There would have been things worth stealing. The guys there, not necessarily able to defend themselves very easily, as we said, and so on, okay. And it's the same people who are writing the accounts of what's going on. So what some scholars have been saying for the past, well, since, say, the 60s, there's a kind of, you know, people shifting to kind of being a bit more politically correct or revising things in the 60s and 70s, whatever. But some scholars have increasingly been arguing that we've got the Vikings wrong, in a sense, that we've, we've been given this unfair Hagar the Horrible impression of them because it's these weedy monks in their monasteries that are running away and being attacked. And so they're naturally going to write about the, mon the, mon the monasteries being attacked and presenting a negative and violent picture of the Vikings. But that's just an inevitable product of what's going on. And this is therefore an, a biased or imbalanced picture of Viking activity and so on. Some people will then say, well, that's all very nice, but they were still killing people, so we shouldn't go too far the other way and say they're nice little Vikings and pat them on the head and things like that. And the same guys who presumably were sometimes being violent could also be involved in trade and exploration and settlement eventually and things like that. It wasn't that some were good and some were bad. Uh, again, perhaps the younger men did things or different points in the year and so on. So. The problem we've got, the, we're trying to get out of, we get a little bit of an impression of it from this source, is that the primary sources, the contemporary primary sources emanating from uh, Western Europe are emanating from primarily Western European churches written by churchmen, and they're the very places that the Vikings are attacking largely, not exclusively, but to a large extent for various reasons that we've discussed. And so they're probably giving us, to some extent, uh, a slightly biased or overbalanced uh, impression of Viking activity in that way. Whether we go take that to its logical conclusion or not is, is obviously up to debate and so on, things like that. If the Vikings had left us their own historical accounts, they may have been similar, they may have been quite different, uh, but we don't have them. Okay, we shall resume after the break. 
and we'll look at what happens specifically in England, uh, Ireland, Scotland and Wales very briefly then. Thank you.